Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Articulate Geography with Political Economy, Geographies of Capitalism, Putting the Economy in Its Place. My name is Meg. I work as an external engagement officer at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am hosting this webinar from the land of the Darug people. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are joining in from today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Um, I hope everyone is safe in this continuing lockdown. To all year 12 students, I hope the trial exams went well. There has been many announcements in high school space in the last one week. With the continuing changes in this space, I think it is ever more important to look after each other and yourself. So please seek support in your school, family and friends as needed. Um, just a quick housekeeping. This will be recorded and made available online for anyone who needs to catch up later on. Um, also, this webinar involves some interactive elements and there is a live Q&A session at the end. I am excited to have Dr. Gareth Bryant presenting this webinar to you today. Dr. Gareth Bryant is a political economist at the University of Sydney. He works as a senior lecturer in the Department of Political Economy and as economist in residence with the Sydney Policy Lab. Dr. Bryant researches how public policy and public finance can create more sustainable, equal and democratic economies. His research has focused on issues including climate change, higher education, housing, labor, and indigenous justice. His research crosses the disciplines of heterodox economics, economic geography, and economic sociology. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Gareth Bryant. People and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, I'm looking forward to also answering your questions afterwards. So keep those in mind and um, we'll be able to get on with the, the discussion after my presentation. So I understand that um, people today are mostly enrolled in HSC uh, geography, and I'm sure some of you are also enrolled in HSC economics as well. So it's been a little while since I did those in my own HSC so I went and had a look at, at, at the syllabus and you know for, for both geography and economics and I was interested to see that both have um, what I'm going to introduce today as, a, as an economic geography perspective so you can see in the geography syllabus uh, there's a keen focus on the people and economic activity topic uh, which is based on looking at geographical aspects of economic activity and also in the economic syllabus too, there's a focus on Australia's place in the global economy. And that word place is going to be important for us today. Um, but to start with, both of them use this word economy. Um, and from my perspective here in the Department of Political Economy at Sydney Uni, that's interesting because the idea of what the economy is, is actually something that is contested and not everybody agrees on. So, on the one hand, there's a kind of conventional definition of the economy that focuses on what happens in markets and how buyers and sellers uh, exchange products, goods and services. We can also broaden out this idea of the, what the economy is um, to a much wider definition that looks at how people interacting with each other, as well as the natural environment, reproduce themselves and our society more generally. And this understanding of the economy then influences what economics actually studies. So conventionally, you'll get this definition of economics if, if you Google it, um, and it will come up with something like the study of how rational decision makers allocate scarce resources. And that is important, um, but we can go broader than that from a political economy perspective where we can look at systems of provisioning both for profit, but as also for human need. And we can look at how that happens in markets, yes, but also through policy, through community initiatives and more. 
So that gets us to the political economy perspective that I'll be talking to you about today, which at Sydney, we, we, Sydney Uni, we understand as real world economics. So we look at the economy, not just in terms of supply and demand curves, they're part of economics and the economy, but the economy is so much more than that. And so we study the economy in its social, political, historical, and importantly for those of you today, especially those of you who are keen geographers, it's geographical context. So this is what we mean by economic geography. We look at how economic processes shape and are shaped by spaces. So spaces such as workplaces where paid work takes place, but also places like households where I imagine most of you are zooming in today from. Uh, we look at place, so why the location of economic activity matters. We look at scale. So we look at the economy at a local level, at a regional level, at a national level, at an international level, and everything in between and the interactions between those scales. We look at landscapes, so both natural landscapes as well as the human built landscapes, the, the roads, the buildings, the infrastructure that is uh, part of our economy. And we look more generally at the environmental context of the economy and understand the economy as being embedded within broader ecological systems. So that's today's focus, which is on what we're calling spaces of capitalism, putting the economy in its place. And we want to put the economy in its place um, in two ways. Firstly, by placing economic activity and understanding economic activity as embedded in particular places. Um, but we're also putting the economy in its place uh, in the sense of understanding that the economy exists within a whole range of social and environmental systems. So to illustrate the usefulness of economic geography, I thought we should start with the big issue of the day, um, especially um, for those of us who are based in Sydney and New South Wales, uh, which is what's going on in terms of COVID-19 cases and, and transmission. So this is a graph that I, a map that I took from the New South Wales Health Department website, which shows the geographical distribution of COVID-19 cases that have been acquired in the last two weeks by local government area, which is one scale um, of political economic activity. What this shows is that the spread of COVID-19 has been highly geographically unequal, and it's concentrated in areas of Western Sydney and South Western Sydney in particular, um, whereas cases tend to be a little lower than that, relatively speaking, in Eastern Sydney. So this is health data. This is a measurement of people who are testing positive for COVID and where they live. Um, so it's not directly economic, uh, economic data, but as economic geographers, we can think through what this might have to do with the economy and how the economy is spatially organised. So I'm going to just switch screens now and um, talk you through a map that I've put together through Google Maps. And you don't need to go, go to that link on screen at the moment, uh, but it's there for you in case you're interested in having a, a look later. So this is obviously a, a map of Sydney. Um, and I'm bringing this into the discussion here in order to try and understand how, despite the lockdown that we've been experiencing for quite some time now, so much transmission is still occurring first primarily within essential workplaces and then throughout families. So I thought it might be useful to have a look at where some of this essential work is taking place. So we know during lockdown, we've got lots of people working, studying, cooking at home and just relaxing at home. And in a modern economy, there's, a whole, there's some things that are necessary for that to actually happen. And one of the things that is really necessary for that to happen uh, 
is that the products, the goods and services that we need uh, in order to work at home, study at home and relax at home tend to go through central warehouses that distribute products either to the stores that then we, we buy from, for example, through click and collect or directly to our front doorsteps via the postal system. So let's start with food. If you or one of your parents has, has brought, bought something from Woolworths recently, it's probably gone through one of these three locations. Warehouse at Mitchenbury, warehouse at Erskine Park, or a warehouse at Eunora. If your family is more of a, a Coles family, it's probably gone through one of these places uh, around Coles Eastern Creek or Coles Mitchenbury. We can add IGA into the mix there. Their warehouse is again uh, in Western Sydney in Huntingwood. And we can throw Audi in there too. And their uh, warehouse, their central warehouse is in Mitchenbury in Western Sydney. You might also have needed to buy some office furniture like a printer um, or a uh, desk or, or printer ink or a webcam to help you do your study. If you've got that from Officeworks, it's probably gone through this Eunora distribution centre in southwestern Sydney. If you've needed to buy electronics uh, like a new laptop computer, that might have come through Bing Lee. Uh, again, in southwestern Sydney, in Old Guildford. If you've needed to, uh, if you've needed a new ch a new chair to support your uh, sitting at your desk to do your um, study all day, that might have gone through the main IKEA uh, distribution centre, uh, which is in. Uh, let's zoom out to get that which is up there in Northwestern Sydney in Marsden Park. You might've gone, gotten ordered something online from Harvey Norman. Again, uh, that one's in Blacktown. And if you've purchased anything in terms of a uh, post that's been posted to your door, whether it's um, a bit, some, some clothing, some new trackies to, to, to uh, chill at home in or anything else, that's probably gone through the, the Australia Post Postal um, Main Postal Service, which is there uh, in inner southwestern Sydney in Chalora. So, looking at this map then of all of the different warehouses uh, that are in play to, to keep lockdown going and to enable people to work, study, and cook from home, hopefully, you're starting to see a bit of a, a geographical pattern here where that essential work that has been done to support the lockdown is been primarily done in Western and Southwestern Sydney. These, of course, if you think back to the map that we've just looked at before, is where most of the COVID transmission is taking place. So I'm providing this today as a, as a, as a fairly illustrative kind of analysis, a much more in-depth analysis um, is needed than what I can present to you in a couple of minutes here. And, I don't have specific knowledge about what's been going on in these warehouses um, that are on this map. But I think what it does show is the usefulness of an economic geography perspective in showing how the different spaces, different places and different scales of economic activity, in this case, the work that takes place uh, in the economy has important implications for what happens in our society and environment more generally. So I'm going to switch back here to the slides because I've got something for you guys to do now, which is uh, a little exercise in economic geography. So keeping in mind uh, those central warehouses that we've just gone through, the ones that are in primarily in Western and Southwestern Sydney, whether it's Woolworths, whether it's Coles, whether it's Officeworks, whether it's Ikea, whether it's Bingley, or whether it's a a package that you might have received um, for, for something else. Um, I want you to think about 
think about something that you've got in your house at the moment. So it might be in your kitchen pantry. It might be in your fridge. It might be in your fruit bowl. It might be in your bedroom. It might be in your lounge room. Something, whether it's a bit of food, whether it's a bit of electronics, whether it's a bit of furniture, whether it's clothing, whether it's anything else, I want you to think about something that you can imagine might have actually travelled through one of those central warehouses on its way into your house. And I'd like, if possible, for you to follow this Padlet link and answer a couple of quick questions for a few minutes. So you can access that Padlet through a link, which I think Meg is going to share or might have already shared, um, or you can use the QR code on the screen if you get your phone out and uh, do that through your, your phone camera, that'll take you there. So I've got some five questions, which are five key questions that you might, that you would ask as an economic geographer. So the questions are, what is it? So just simply, what is it? Who made it? Um, so think about the person and what kind of work they might worker they might have been, the process through which it was made, where it was made, so what location you think this product might have been made, and lastly, why you think it was made uh, in that way. Um, so what were the sort of forces that um, decided where it was made, what what company was making it. Uh, and um, the process, the technology, et cetera, that might have been used to make it. So please uh, go and fill out those questions now. For, I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. Um, and importantly, I don't expect you to know the answers to all those questions. So what you know is going to be just as important as what you don't know. And if you don't know, please write unsure and we'll use that in our discussion. So I'll give you a few minutes. I'll, I can see there's a few question answers already coming in and we'll get back to it uh, in a second. So it's fantastic to see all these answers coming through. Keep it up. I'll um, just to start to, to have a look through it as, the, as they're coming through. So um, in terms of what is it, I can imagine this is the kind of easiest thing to answer. So we've got some answers like photo frame, candle, bread, desk, notebook, bottle, uh, tin of black beans. So that was probably the easiest one. And those are the exact same. Those are great answers and all things that would have come through a few of those different warehouses that we talked about. Um, thinking about who made it. So there's an interesting mix of, of answers there. So some of you have, have identified the, the company or the brand that made it. Some of you, um, whether it's uh, Ikea or, or Anko or Franklin, um, some of you have, have uh, identified the kind of worker, um, but less of you have done that. So somebody said maybe it was a farmer and warehouse worker, but that has been less um, identified, which I think for good reason, it, it's actually hard to know. How is it made? So we've got a mix of understanding, thinking about warehouses and factories that might have been involved, um, but somebody's answered unsure, a very automated process they're assuming. Where was it made? Um, so we have a mix of a lot of people saying China, um, some people saying Australia, and then, some, uh, and then some people again saying unsure, but they're hoping it was made locally. And lastly, why was it made that way? And here's some great answers here. So we're identifying some of the key processes of capitalism and its economy. So looking for cheap labor, so where the cost of labor is cheapest, looking for efficient efficiency, where you can produce something for the lowest cost. Um, we're looking at policy questions here too. So US farm subsidies is another, um, is another great answer there. So, those are all, thank you so much for, for that quick work. I really, um, I'm really impressed by that. Um, and I'm hoping that I'll see some of you guys in my classes in a few years time, because that's an excellent, um, excellent engagement. Um, what's interesting there is that some, is that the limited, I think, information that we have. So some of you have been able to piece that together, where things have come from, why they were made in a certain way, who made it. Some of you might have looked, for example, at a made in China or a made in Australia label, but that kind of information is actually quite uneven in terms of the way it's produced. And there's a good reason for that. That's actually what markets do. So what, what ends up happening is a product that is reduced to a price. Um, it's something 
that uh, there's a dollar figure that's put on it. The seller sells it for that price, the buyer buys it for that price. But what that often misses is a key other factor, a key other actor that's sort of the silent partner of that buying and selling relationship. And that's the person who was doing the work to produce that thing. Um, and thing is really the wrong word because what looks like a thing is actually not really a thing at all, but actually a complex web of work that has taken place all over Sydney in those warehouses, but also connected to the rest of the world. And the job of the economic geographer, as well as the political economist, is to uncover this hidden world. So a famous example of this was the case of Mr. Daisy and the Apple factory. So that Mr. Daisy and the Apple factory was a episode of a popular episode of the American podcast, uh, This American Life, which you might have come across yourself. This episode was first aired in 2012. And it told the story of a person, Mr. Daisy, who got a rare glimpse into what is usually hidden from consumers. Um, so they what they uh, found out is they found out a, a story of a person who, when they opened their new iPhone, it actually already had some photos on it. Um, and this is one of the photos that, that was on the phone. Um, and the photos that were taken on the phone were actually of the factory in which the phone was produced. And they were obviously had been taken just to test the camera by the workers, but that something had gone wrong and those photos weren't actually uh, deleted. And so this provided a kind of rare window into what is usually unseen when we buy and sell things like iPhones. And so what the photo showed was some of the working conditions faced by Apple workers in Foxconn factories in Shenzhen, China. So Mr. Daisy, the guy who was narrating the episode, uh, found out about these photos and basically decided to go and do some economic geography. And this is a quote from that episode. He said, it's the third largest city in China and it's the place where almost all of your stuff and the most amazing thing is almost no one in America knows its name. Isn't that remarkable? That there's a city where almost all of our stuff comes from and no one knows its name. I mean, we think we uh, do know where our stuff's come from. We're not ignorant. We think our stuff comes from China, right? That kind of a generalized way, China, but it doesn't come from China. It comes from Shenzhen. It's a city, it's a place. And so here, Mr. Daisy starting to do economic geography, asking questions like, where was it produced? Why was it made there? How did it actually end up from the city, from the factory in China through to this, uh, the, the um, consumer's pocket in the US in this case? And so this episode was listened to millions of, listened millions of times, but it ended up being quite controversial because what Mr. Daisy did in this episode was re also report seeing things and talking to people that actually were secondhand stories that, it, that the stories had changed and therefore could not actually be verified. And so what this also showed was that uh, the field work he was doing, and I know many of you in geography have been doing a bit of field work as part of your uh, own HSC, the field work wasn't necessarily super trustworthy. And so there was another important lesson here um, and something that uh, we will uh, stress in from a political economy perspective in, in my classes, is to always be critical of these sources and do the things uh, yourself. So just to wrap up um, then, um, if you're interested in economic geography, political economy at Sydney Uni is a good place for you to think about doing it, something that you can do in conjunction with a geography major, uh, which also does a bit of economic geography in the science faculty. Um, and what political economy does is basically provide you with a critical framework for doing, in a lot of ways, a better job uh, than what was done by Mr. Daisy. So Mr. Daisy was asking the right questions, but he didn't have that rigorous framework to be able to analyze what was really happening in the world of work. Um, and so what we do at uh, political economy is that we provide different ways of doing economics. Um, so different schools of economic thought we, we argue that by combining different schools of economic thought, different ways of looking at the economy, you get a much fuller picture on the key questions that we're facing today. So including what's going on in the world of work and in the world of labour from a geographical perspective. So these are some of the schools of thought that we tend to look at. 
it, we might look at classical political economy, which uh, might understand the world, um, the economy in terms of where things are produced, in terms of who has a comparative advantage. China's better at producing some things, Australia's better at producing other things, and they will trade. We might take a Marxist uh, approach, which understands the employment relationship in terms of exploitation between classes. We might take a what's called a neoclassical or a conventional economic approach, and that looks at the allocation of labour inefficient whether it's efficient or whether it's inefficient. We might take an institutionalist approach to understand well, what's going on in those warehouses in terms of employment regulations, in terms of wages and conditions and how they're set through policy mechanisms as well as bargaining between workers and their bosses. We might take a Keynesian approach and think, well, with all this work being done and other work not being done, what does that mean for the overall levels of growth and demand in our macro economy? We might take a feminist perspective and think about well, what are the gender inequalities that are taking place in uh, the way that pay rates are set, the way that labour markets are segregated in terms of more masculine and more feminine types of um, industries. And we make sure that we always stress that the ecological aspect. Um, so an ecological school of thought, we look at is capitalism sustainable? So are the sorts of patterns of consumption and production the globalized system of trade and production and how you can order, you know, a um, how how you can order a new pair of pajamas from China and it gets to you gets to you the next week. How is whether whether that's a sustainable system? So that's what we do in political economy. Um, hopefully, uh, you are able to explore the options that are available to you and make the most of your exciting journey as you shift from school to university. And if you've got any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting um, looking at those um, geographical maps of um, distributions and how we can actually investigate based on what we have around us on think, start thinking about where does it come from? Where is, where is it made? Um, things like that. So thank you so much. Um, should I share the um, political economy links you had in the last slide? Um, uh, yeah, that'd be great. Oh, I, I did sure. have one more slide with a couple of links <laughs> to follow up, which I didn't show. So that would be fantastic. These are just some links from the uh, blog that we run as a political economy department. Um, and it features a, a couple of kind of overview um, posts. One is a video and one's more of a written explanation, which is talking about what we do in more detail at political economy at, at Sydney Uni, which is part of the arts faculty. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so the Q&A, I do have uh, a few questions. So can you speak to the nation state and how geographic boundaries relate to political systems and the economy? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a fantastic question um, because it gets to the fact, I think, that the kind of political and economic spaces that we're talking about are not kind of naturally gifted uh, from the way that we kind of, you know, in terms of the way that the world is organised, but are actually socially and politically created. And so those boundaries that become real kind of boundaries for organizing economic activity. So for example, on the topic that we're talking about today, which has been focused on work in particular, within the boundaries of Australia, we have a system of industrial relations, which has a, which provides a set of minimum standards around wages, around conditions, around rights of workers and, and relative rights um, of employers. So that system is a kind of political creation. So it's both constructed in the sense that it's a product of history, it's a product of what happened in terms of, you know, the colonisation of Australia and the um, development of Australian institutions. So it's constructed in that sense, um, but it's also real in the sense that, uh, in the sense that for workers and for employers, they have to then operate within that system. So 
there's always that sort of tension, I think, thinking in terms of, of economic geography uh, between the kind of social construction of space um, and the role that space plays in regulating our lives in very real ways. The other thing to note there is that because boundaries are constructed, that means they can also change. Um, and so we also always need to be aware of uh, how politics, the role of ongoing politics in um, potentially changing what for now is fixed, but in the future might end up um, being put back into motion. Thank you, very interesting. Um, so another question we have, if you study economic geography, what careers are available to you? It is interesting, but sounds really general and broad. Yeah, I think that's that's spot on, that it is kind of broad. Um, so economic geography is sort of one of the things that, that we study as part of the broader political economy program at um, Sydney. And, and a lot of our students actually do geography major, which is in the Faculty of Science, uh, and political economy, which is in the Faculty of Arts. And so you can actually do both of those things. Um, in terms of what uh, you can do, so we have, um, we have a, in terms of our actual um, political economy graduates, uh, we have people in prominent kind of policy roles. Uh, so you might have seen, for example, one of our recent graduates, Alison Pennington. Uh, she's an economist for the Centre of Future Work. She's been uh, commenting a lot on uh, the situation in the Australian economy and how the COVID crisis has affected that. Uh, we have a lot of people in the media. So uh, if you look at the, um, the ABC, for example, uh, you'll, you'll see people like Michael Yander, who's one of the business reporters. He was a political economy, economic geography uh, graduate. Um, we get people who are working in treasury, if you're interested in a, in a, in a career in the government. Uh, we get people who, are work, who end up working in urban planning. So really across the media, across uh, NGOs, across government, as well as across the private sector. So um, another example is a, an honours student I had who's just picked up a graduate job at Deloitte, uh, one of the big accounting firms. So it is general and broad, but that is a strength um, in the sense that it gives you a lot of different opportunities because you know, you'll be looking at a set, you'll be developing a set of skills that can be used in all sorts of contexts, which is going to make for a more interesting career. Thank you very much. I think it's a really great question and a good, good thing that we can share this kind of actual career opportunities because especially things like political economy, which our high school students, in a sense, learning as part of a different subject, but the, there's no subject called political economy in high school. So I think it's a great way to understand what's the career path and what kind of opportunities are out there. Um, we have a question from Rachel. Would students studying at UCID be able to focus on progressive economic theory? For example, work of people like uh, Kate sorry, my apology, Kate Rawls, as opposed yeah. to outdated traditional theory, which focuses on GDP, et cetera. Yeah, thank you for that question, Rachel. That, that's precisely what we do in, in political economy. So uh, we look at all different schools of thought um, so we do look at, you know, we have to, we look at the, the mainstream, which includes things like GDP and trade, international trade and conventional understandings of that, because that tends to be the still an important way of thinking about the economy, if you're going to work in, in business or in government and so on. But we importantly put that in conversation with precisely the kind of progressive economic theories that you're talking about. So Kate Rowworth, for those who don't know her, you obviously do. Rachel, uh, she has the idea of um, donut economies, which is looking at um, the idea that the economy is embedded in a broader ecological system, which places limits on economic activity um, and makes an argument that we need to shift beyond outdated measures like GDP and growth and think more in terms of well-being and sustainability. 
So that's absolutely uh, what we do. Um, that's the kind of pluralist approach we take, pluralist in the sense of looking at different ideas of the economy. So we absolutely look at rail work, rail work. we look at um, ecological and feminist ideas of the economy. We also look at Marxist institutionalist Keynesian um, ideas of the economy. And so we really focus on the whole history of economic thought um, from you know, Adam Smith starting in the 1700s right through to modern political economists like Kate Railworth, uh, like Stephanie Kelton with modern, modern monetary theory, like Mariana Mazzucato, who's looking at um, uh, different conceptions of value. So all of the and everything in between. So if that's what you're into, then political economy is definitely going to be the place for you. Thank you very much for answering those questions. Um, I think, um, I think, unless anyone else has any questions, um, I just want to thank everyone for joining and um, thank you, um, Dr. Gareth Bryant for um, um, sharing your expertise and answering all those questions. I would like everyone to participate in the evaluation, um, what you thought about the presentation, but also in general about the Articulate webinar series which we've been run, running this year. Um, so do let me know. I just put the evaluation link in the chat. Um, I'm also going to, while you are doing that, I'm just also going to share a few other links. The so one is um, the Articulate webinar series. Um, which we have one more to go next week on French continuous and extension, but also social sciences week is between 6 to the 12th of September, so which is next week. On Monday the 6th, we do have the politics and bad behavior, anti-vaxxers and anti-science backlash. We also have on Wednesday at 11 a.m. emotional inequality in pandemic Australia, on the same day at 4 p.m., we do have the Articulate High School webinar on French. Um, on Friday the 10th at 11 a.m., uh, we have COVID, green energy, social and natural environments, which Dr. Gareth Bryant is actually one of the speakers, so I highly encourage everyone to attend. And finally, on the same day at 2 p.m., from veil out to basic income. And obviously, I'm aware that um, these social sciences week events, everyone's probably at school. Um, if you have free time or um, your, if your teachers or parents and ca um, caregivers who would like to join in, I would highly encourage you to join us. Um, Gareth, would you like to say anything before we conclude? No, that's all just to wish everybody um, all the best and very happy for, you know, people to get in touch with me. You can search me on, um, yeah, my profile at Sydney Uni, if you have an email or something like that, I'm very happy to, to answer further questions um, about anything that's come up or, or, or what potentially you might be interested in doing at, um, at university. So good luck. Great. Thank you very much. Good luck, everyone. Have a wonderful evening.